quick test of sound. Quick test of sound. Alrighty. Welcome to Nikos RPG. This is uh, Game Master Soapbox, and I am your host, Jonathan Albin. And uh, we have as our, our usual strategy, a uh, series of topics that I want to talk about tonight. And uh, they're listed here beside us. We're going to be looking at how magic works in Nikos RPG in reference to the way other systems operate. We're going to be looking at history, time, and the grand cycle of the Nikos adventure world. We're going to talk about a device that I use to kick off the, each session. <clears throat> I lovingly call our story so far. Then we're going to go into my rant for the day, which is arguing semantics. It's uh, near and dear and a bit of a pit peeve of mine, maybe uh, a bit of a uh, over overindulgence drives me crazy, but we'll get to that in a minute. And then the secret to effective in-game prophecy, one of the most effective tools that I found in running a role-play game to provide the players with the concept of external agency, even then they're the ones that are making the decisions in-game. Pardon me while I have to adjust my lights. I, I am my own technician. So, as we get started tonight, I want to uh, talk about the topics that are mentioned already. And let me get my pages all set up here. I've got a form and a function to the way I do things. And it's just better to have them all set up first. And uh, I didn't fail to do that this time around. Alrighty, so I'm not properly adjusted into my position in front of the camera. That happens sometimes. And in this case, it looks like it was actually a matter of the camera getting adjusted. Probably when I move the table over here. Alrighty, so the Game Master Soapbox is a uh, podcast that I started recently with the idea of carrying information out to you, the players, about roleplay games from my rather extensive uh history with the properties and I'll eventually figure out how to do all these different things. Alrighty, so uh, the Game Master Soapbox in this case, we're, the first thing we're talking about is how magic works and when you are dealing with a fantasy setting, the very concept of how magic works really does has to depend on what the physics of the world are. In other words, if magic is a quantifiable measurable thing you have to have ways to quantify and measure it if it are if magic is something that is fast and loose and left to the interpretation of each party member and each player then the storyteller has to have a pretty good handle on what the universe can accept or won't accept in terms of how those magics work and such so uh in the in the case of traditional role play games such as dungeons and dragons the magic works by a list of spells that are provided to the spellcaster according to his skills and the theme of the magic that he's going to be in, involved with and then the mechanic of the game which would be whether he's casting it as something that he has in his memory or if it's something that he has to read from a book as an incantation or if it's a will in the word, or even if it's a manifestation of an external dimensional being that's a giving assistance. All of these are different ways of handling how magic works, but in the Nikos RPG mechanism, the first thing that needs to be known is that magic is everywhere. The very nature of magic in the world stems from the solar energy produced by the fantasy game realm in particular, the Nikos world's sun. So in the world of Nikos, the sun isn't called the sun. Obviously, the sun is called Nimbus. And Nimbus is a protostar, so its physical appearance doesn't look like our sun. Instead, it's got stripes or striations such as uh, our Jupiter does. Because in, uh, in fact, the Nimbus body is actually a, a pseudo planetary body a if you will a very nearly a, a a star nearly a a brown dwarf type of meta star and it, it the idea is that it is generating the energy necessary for the world to exist 
And because it's in this odd band of energy, it includes a material that manifests as mystical effects or magic effects. And this material is measurable literally in terms of its molecular structure as, some, as particles called magicals, M-A-G-I-C-L-E-S. And so the number of magicals that are being involved in this spell determine its effectiveness, its uh, color, effect, duration, et cetera, et cetera. So each of the manifest, manifestation uh, elements derive from the actual magicals themselves. So that's all well and good, but a player who is new to the system just wants to know what magical effects he or she can create. He doesn't really care about all of the meta world information, although it's arguably interesting and challenging to try to put your mind around. It's really not something that should be uh, elementally difficult. And so the way magic manifests is literally up to the player in terms of what, f what flavor, what feeling he wants to generate when he does his magics and the nature of the magics will be dependent upon the type of craft he wishes to do and how it manifests in the world now the amount of magicals is a difficult subject to talk about because how do you measure it are you, you pour it out in a cup do you uh, sift it by the grain what's the mechanic well in the world of nikos there is a mnemonic term that covers all the different uh, levels of graduated magicals that can be used and that word is spectacalitan and spectacalitan is a long syllable where it doesn't mean anything on its own except that it captures each level of the spell's power in reference to the amount so a spec obviously a small amount barely visible amount uh, like a pinch or less, is a speck. Then a tick would be about what you could hold in the palm of your hand, some small number of ounces, whether it be a liquid or a solid or whatever. That tick of magic is going to be at a, going to create graduatedly more powerful spells than the specks would. And then the next group above that would be a cow, and a cow or a call is a mountain you can carry in two hands together. So a call is a considerable amount of magics, but this could be, you know, a liquid. It could be a it could be a, a a physical substance, or it could be literally just the volume of space that it's held in. Then beyond that is a lot, and a lot is what you can hold in your hands in in two arms or so. And the the lot of magic is a considerable volume, and usually involves itself in larger uh, practical effects and such like. So a lot would be a lot, you know, in terms of how much you would carry. And then beyond that would be a ton. And while ton actually specifically has a meaning in the modern day of 2,000 pounds, imperial scale, 1,000 pounds, um, or the 2,000 pounds, the concept of a ton is not so specific. So you could have a wagon load or a truck load, and that would be still considered to be a ton of magic even if it physically didn't come out to be all that much in other dimensions like density and such. But spectacalitan is a term that casters, will, uh, that, that, and I'm not going to use the word casters because the idea of spells by definition are somewhat uh, irrelevant because all triggered effects in magic are called magical effects. And so you, you would create a, create a a method for your spell effect and perhaps that's singing a song as in uh, spell singing maybe it's uh, harmonizing or vibrating to two different crystals in this case it would be crystal singing or crystallomancy um, but all the different forms of magic are associated with the, the spectacles in, in terms of volume so a person that's going to trigger an effect when he's beginning is going to be starting with the lowest amount and any magics that he attempts to do that are above that pay grade so to speak that are at the higher levels run greater risks and i'm going to go into those in the later video because you need to talk about side effects and, and uh, backfires of magic but generally speaking the magical system would require the spellcaster to the, the the 
Magi or the uh, person that is affecting the magical effect to determine how much material he's working with, a speck all the way up to a ton, or and also what type of magics he's going to do. And so the, f the form of magics that he's going to do are going to be dependent upon what school or what strategy or what methodology they wish to cast. And I, just like in the case of all classes, if, if there are no longer a uh, particular bent of spellcaster, there's no particular way of enacting an effect that players can't have an agency in determining. So it's a little fast and loose and, and therefore a little, little uh, interpretive, if you will. But the storyteller can work you through exactly what your uh, effects will trigger or whatever. So just realize that magic it depends on the spectacleton, the material you're using, or the source, in other words, and the type of magics. So we will go more into that at a later time, but that's the general basis of how magic works. All right, the Nikos timeline. In the 1970s, when I first started playing, the concept of an ongoing story was built into the mindset of most players because they are, were considering the books that were available at the time that also were in a fantasy setting, and many of them, most of them, as a matter of fact, were book series. There was more than one volume, and the story carried out over time. And so, therefore, the concept of a long-term cycle, long cycle, or in some other terms, a long year, that period that the campaign would continue on a direct course to its completion. For me, it took about six and a half years to actually create. And thereafter, I have started the beginning and run the arc, the story arc, from beginning to end, a total of, of eight times so far. So each iteration, each restart of the game brought better understanding about the universe, more clear uh, awareness of how this, the mechanics of the for example, spellcraft would work, and also the concept of what the arc's relevance would be to the people who are playing in the system. So, in this case, the arc runs for six and a half years, fundamentally in real time, and therefore every six and a half to seven years I start over again. And so, as we are beginning into the ninth iteration, we're beginning new campaigns, and at this point, I want to mention that there are two games and two games a week right now at the uh, at our sponsors show, and our sponsor is Board Game Paradise. The logo is right there. Board Game Paradise is in Redlands, California, and our game sessions are on Mondays and Tuesdays, starting at 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, they are there are is a, a table fee of ten dollars required to participate to help cover the defray the cost of operating the store but the arc is just getting started so whether this would be your first week or if you've been a veteran playing with us for a while you definitely would uh would be welcome at the game store uh board games paradise is a full game full service game store covering board games card games miniatures games and of course role-playing games and i want to give a big shout out to them because they've been really good to me and we have a, couple, a great couple of groups and we've been operating with them for a little over a year so thank you and big props to them and uh, make sure you check out their uh, location at boardgamesparadise.com they're also on facebook at board games paradise and uh, and they also are at the one is 109 state street in redlands california downtown so so the grand scale, the, the long-term arc of Nykos' story is six and a half years. And it is broken into fundamentally three, three periods of time. There's the beginning, the middle, and the end. Uh, in, the, in each of the time periods, beginning, middle, and end have a beginning and an ending. So it's the beginning of the beginning, then the end of the beginning, beginning of the middle, end of the middle, beginning of the end, and end of the, be end of the end. So that structure gives an idea of how many different factional chunks are, that go into this. And each one of them is a rising and falling of a different position of the 
individual story arcs that are made up that that can that make up the overall story arc so you don't feel like you have to worry about getting in the weeds we are early in the campaigns and it's relatively quick to see what is going on in those games so the concept of the grand cycle is that in the first iteration several of the players wrote down a, a, fundamentally a diary of the campaign and therefore there was a framework upon which I could run the second iteration and add to that by the third iteration I have players that are writing their own volumes that are fundamentally a retelling of their part of the story and they themselves have a Uh, beginning and end so I lost my train of thought there oh, forgive me the idea though is that the grand, the grand cycles long term is a series of shorter campaign arcs as a matter of fact during the ninth, the eighth iteration the one that just is, cl is closing out now during the eighth iteration I had as many as 11 separate campaign groups playing through full story arcs till they reach fundamentally their level, their, their paragon level or their advancement to, to the highest level that they could get to in a role playing game, namely then second edition. And now as we're beginning the, the ninth iteration, the system has transferred because the world itself is finally locked into the mechanisms of Dark Shards, the Nikos RPG fantasy setting. So. Having said all that, we are in the beginning of the binning, so if you want to be a part of the campaigns, you can certainly do that. We have the group on Monday, which is a fun way, a veteran group that is on the, they're actually finishing out the ending of the ending, so they are in the eighth iteration still. Then I've got a group on Monday that just started up, I'm sorry, on Tuesday that just started up, and that's also 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., and that one is in the Nikos RPG mechanism. Then I have a Wednesday group that is a private house game, but it is integrally tied into this campaign themselves, and they are aware of how fast we are approaching the end of the iteration, and so they're racing to accomplish their objectives before the time runs out. And then on Sunday, I have a group that I run for my pat patron supporters, and so if you want to be involved with a game that is online, we utilize... The discord mechanism to resolve role play through narrative uh, uh, in a voice chat there so if you become a patron at the $20 level or higher you can actually access the discord server as a communicant and a community member and therefore thereby become a matter of that role-playing group on Sundays so it's a great way if you've never role played to get your feet wet with a group of highly compassionate players who also have great desire to support the new players coming into the marketplace. So make sure if you can join us on Sundays. And then finally, of course, I've mentioned before, starting on this Saturday, we're going to be running a grand experiment RPG experience. So if you are a role player and you don't have, uh, if you have, if you've got time free on Saturday, from 10 a.m. and until 2 o'clock p.m. Pacific, I'll be running a Nikos RPG fantasy setting game that will be uh, operating specifically through Twitch, and thereby, even if you're not able to join us through the Discord uh, and a membership as a patron, patron, you can still play by showing up in the chat and proposing information for the characters in the story to do. Uh, there'll be a whole lot more on that coming up. All right, uh, the, we're now getting ready to go for our story so far. One of the biggest challenges in running a multiple series of games, especially if they are contemporaneous and they're running in different portions of your fantasy realm at the same time, there needs to be a way to have a handle on what each group is doing. And one way is to take extensive notes and track what each player made as a decision during a game session, and then the following week be able to basically pick up at the very end of the round in which the other players were engaged or whatever. But what I've determined to do is I've got so much going on in so many different campaigns, 
it's not feasible for my pea brain to hold on to all the possible places and things that the players are involved with. So instead, I use the Arc Story So Far model. And what that means is at the beginning of each session, I turn to one or more players and say, okay, Steve, Scott, whatever, it's your, it's your week. I need you to provide us with the our story so far. And then that player recollects what he can, what he does remember from the previous week's event. And then he opens it up to other players to provide additional input so that by the time the players have com concluded taking their shots at speaking, you will have a coherent direction and course for the group. Now, what's interesting is this is a fallible system. There are certainly cases where the players chose a clear set of actions at the end of one ca campaign section, but the following week they can't remember any of that and another person comes up with a different idea that's just as compelling and the players pursue that instead. The idea, therefore, is that the idea that the concept of the our story so far is that we're all on the same page at that moment and if there are changes that need to be made from one week to the next, they're made post hoc instead of in van advance of the game session. So, all right, the next we're going to talk about is my concept of the rant. All right, ladies and gentlemen, strap in because this one's going to be interesting. If you have ever been in a conversation and the, the terminology went something like this, maybe you'll know what I'm talking about. The dungeon master says there's a uh, painting on the left side of the room and it is about chair height uh, chair back height above the floor and you know, this picture has uh, say a boy and a, and a dog well another player hearing that will perhaps say where is the picture compared to the painting well you said there was a painting and this is then you said there was a picture so they're not the same thing so can you clarify or a person will say i'm going to you know in a in a, in a narrative situation says i'm going to run back to the inn and get my my band band or because i want to play some some music well you said you're going to run well run, running that far will cause fatigue and so when you come back you're going to be fatigued and it's and then the person so i didn't say run i just meant go over there and so i didn't mean run so i would actually walk and therefore i won't be all that fatigued and so on so on this back and forth goes on i have to tell you that arguing about semantics is about the, the most egregious problem that i can think of if what i am describing to you in the scene makes enough sense for you to see the image in your brain that should be sufficient. There shouldn't be a need to parse individual words. And I'm just as bad on the other side where someone will say, I want to uh, pick their pocket. And then I say, well, you didn't specify which pocket. And that's, there's problems with, with being semantical because it does cause challenges. But the argu argu arguing here is the disconnect of the role play session that results from challenging the word usage in a definition or in a sentence structure for a dialogue. It's important to remember that the group is playing a game and therefore there may be problems where a person makes a mistake and it's far, far better for you as the hearer to confirm the part you didn't get and pre press on rather than disagreeing or challenging or... Pardon me. Or giving difficulty to the storyteller because he used an improper word or you you recognize that he's being inconsistent it's best to talk about the inconsistency in a general way rather than to argue about well no you said i was on the left side now you're saying i'm on the right side now what is it blah 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 that the very conflict is really what i'm talking about now not that you're not that the gm can't make mistakes or not that the situation shouldn't be rectified it's just the realization that the petty argument that usually goes along with it is generally unproductive and causes people to fall out of appreciation or an even love of the game if this is what they become all the time is mere semantics arguments so the 
way this can be evolved, involved, uh, resolved is that the storyteller, if he is describing something and the player doesn't understand, simply requesting a restate or may I re uh, ask a clarifying question or something along this line. If you're able to create the concrete nature without arguing, you're getting way ahead of the game because even the players who are not in the process are going to appreciate that you're not wasting their time by, by arguing over something. And a lot of the rants, I just realized uh, the last couple of days, a lot of the rants sound like I'm picking on or, or challenging players, but the reality is, is that a game session, the storyteller is responsible for his part, and I agree with the game master being called on the carpet or challenged if he's made a replicative errors or duplication of errors and isn't attempting to fix it. So I get that. But the uh, necessity to argue is really the problem that we have to deal with. And it is the very secret of uh, the game sessions is to get to the point where your arguments about are about substance, not about semantics. And we have to get to that point as quickly as we can in session because if we stay in the rant stage, we tend to, if we stay in that argumentative place, we create uh, controversy, we create drama, we create frustration, and ultimately we harm the story. So if, if the, main, the main point of the rant is that if you get to a point where you recognize that you're contributing to a semantical argument, if you are defending a point, point that is only about the point itself and not about the element of the story and how it influences others, it's best to uh, cease and, and stop that activity. All right, this last one here is kind of fun. Secret to effective in-game prophecy. The best example I can give of this is I had a young player who was very boisterous. He had intention of di becoming disciplined enough to play a paladin and a holy warrior in the game session. He was wanting very much to learn the things that would be necessary to play one of those. And we were having a lot of uh, metagame conversations. This young person had a very uh, active and very kind of rough life as far as he was into sports and a lot of physical activities and things like that. And so he would get wound up. And therefore, when he came to play at the tabletop, uh, it was sometimes hard for him to settle down when he would roam around during the game. He'd stand up and move around and, and, and in general interfere with the calm and the coherency of the other players because he was simply making too much noise. <coughs> well, in that game, one of the challenges was that he wanted so bad to be a paladin and he kept pushing the envelope asking the high priests in the towns and the wise men of the village and such, what do I have to do to become you know, wise? What do I have to do to become smart? But the act actions that he took quite often were in opposition to that and so it was almost like difficult really well it was not like difficult it was difficult to get him to see the moving forward in game as being something that he could be patient about he kept just want to push want to push want to push let's go 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 so in one particular session he was being particularly boisterous and i told him that in game, a part of the story was that he had discovered uh, this religious order. He had found the things he was looking for, but he needed to find ways to achieve the goals. And so he, one of the things he went to do is talk to a seer in game. Now, of course, that seer, as I'm the game master, was me. And the seer warned him that there was a time in his life when he would be found standing alone against a sea of foes with all of his friends lying about him on the ground, killed or injured because of his lack of interaction. And this moment right here was going to define his character. 
Well, that's a nice open-ended prophecy, and anybody could have driven a truck through it as far as organ organizing it. Yeah, I mean, the contrivances that would have to go to make sure it happened that way in many cases would, would be daunting. But the reality of the session turned out that the uh, players had gotten them in a situation where they were going to be facing off against uh, a group of uh, Eldrin from the uh, Everdark uh, concept of a, a band of these uh, shadow elves were going to interfere with them. And so the Eldrin, the, prof the prophecy was that he would be standing above the prone bodies of his associates and he would be holding aloft uh, a powerful sword and in that moment he would know his calling well in game the previous week he had actually discovered this mess mystical sword and so he was carrying around a magic item that was supposedly greatly powerful but he hadn't yet had it inspected or whatever so they went into this encounter the situation and they get teleported by the nemesis into a place where the principal enemies are members of the Everdark clan known as the Greys, the Trelorans, the Shadow Elves. Well, these Grey, or sorry, these uh, Trelorans defeat the party handily, putting each one of them down one by one over a period of several rounds as the, the players fought their best to stay ahead of the conflict, but they were falling behind. Well, at one point, at one moment, he determined that he was going to choose that as the moment that he would draw forth this mystical sword and the sword's name from what he had discovered was justice well literally as he drew the sword and engaged his enemies the city the, the, the people in the encounter that were of the Treloran population got incredibly lucky and each player in turn was put into death saves or very very low hit points back to back to back so that when the round was over, everyone was at a negative on hit points. Everybody was fundamentally in the dying status, except for this paladin. And he was standing there looking at the faces of all of his friends. And he turned and looked at me and said, I don't know how you do that. How did you put me in a situation so I have to be here? Well, I can laugh up my sleeve at it now because the reality is, is that if you're running a game and you have some leverage over the situation, you can certainly get an outcome. But the issue is that he had not seen that before and was visibly shaken, shaken by this because it demonstrated that the game was bigger and more well thought, at least easier to see than to explain. And that then led him to a place where he is a player was by far the best of the <clears throat> um, paladins the holy orders as he can be because he understood and internalized the power of that in-game prophecy so the secret to an effective in-game prophecy are uh, threefold number one the, the prophecy needs to be open-ended. Don't box yourself in a corner. Don't say when it's going to happen. Leave no signs about how frequently these things might occur and whether or not a particular player is specifically involved. <clears throat> now, in this case, obviously, some prophecies are meant to be discovered, as this one was, so that's a little bit different. You can target it to a specific player or, or a specific behavior. But the point here is that the prophecy's power is in its ambiguity because then as the players perceive what's going on in the world, they can then ascribe additional value to that point to make it more viscerally real in terms of your, pro your, your in-game activity around that prophecy. All right, one final section. That is, we've added a couple of bonus features. I'm not really familiar with how Twitch works, but I did give you a couple of goals or objectives to use your uh, chat points. Now, if you're not familiar, Twitch has Twitch 
uh, user points that they provide based on the number of hours of videos you watch, the numbers of activities that you do in stream, and whether you comment or not. So I provide those points systems called magicals, and then you can do magical effects with them. So for example, one of the effects is you can purchase with a few of these points the privilege of naming a town in one of my ongoing campaigns. And you get to pick which one is going to be in. And then I record the portion where you, where your comment was made in game. And then I put that up on the website to promote you for helping me reach this goal. Uh, these goals are associated with the number of likes and followers we get. So make sure you help me to get people involved by sharing this show if you like it and providing perhaps highlights if there's something in particular you'd like me to frequent or, or focus on. That's one way to do it. The second of the goals, and this one's a little crazy, is that I love to sing and I'm not very good. So uh, if you want to hear me sing a either Weird Al or Tom Lehrer song, I will do so once we've uh, achieved a certain number of credits. I think it's 200,000. But the point here is that if you love farcical humor, if you like narrative satire, and you don't mind listening to an old man like me croak songs out, go ahead and put some points into that because it's going to take a while to get there. I believe it's 100,000 points that we have to target, so that's, that's a bit much. So. We have now completed I've did, uh, all the materials that I intended to cover tonight. I'm sure that I rambled a bit and I probably didn't cover everything with any kind of a detail. If you are interested in more information like this, make sure you uh, click the follow button on Twitch. Uh, like this uh, episode if you can. And definitely if you can, share it with your friends because the way this algorithm grows is if we do the things that connect us with each other. In the meantime, I want to thank you for this. Remember the Saturday game at 10 o'clock in the morning on, on this very channel. Remember also the Monday game session at Board Game Paradise, the Tuesday session at Board Game Paradise, and I think that's it at this point. So thank you again for watching, and uh, if you didn't like the show and, and you're, you're ready to you're fed up with it. Thank you nonetheless for the time that you spent watching with us, and I hope to see you next time on the Game Master Soapbox. Have a good day.